I've often thought that uh, God's got a bit of a sense of humour. When I was chatting to Neil and he asked me to uh, speak at the men's weekend and the theme was Men of Courage, the last passage that came to my mind was in the book of Deuteronomy. It's not your typical go-to book in the Bible, is it, when you uh, think of preaching material? And yet, when I was doing my daily devotional, my reading, I was going through the book of Deuteronomy and God just said to me, that's the one, that's the passage that you've got to go to. So we're in Deuteronomy chapter 6. If you haven't got a Bible with you, there are some just over there. You should also have a little sheet as well where I've sort of highlighted some of the key points. So if you haven't got a Bible, now might be the time to run around and get one. But this is all about men of courage. How can we be courageous? And why do we need to be courageous? Well, the Christian life is difficult, isn't it? There are loads of challenges. It's not a simple life to live. Jesus himself tells us that to be a Christian, to be a disciple, we have to take up our cross and follow him. Not literally, but to lay down our lives at the foot of the cross, whatever that may involve. And that is not easy. That involves dying to self. And therefore, we need to be courageous, but with a courage that doesn't come from our own courage. So as I say, we're in the book of Deuteronomy, and hopefully we're going to see some of that this morning in chapter 6. It's one of these chapters, though, that we do need to do a little bit of background before we get into it. Otherwise, we're going to lose some of the context here. So God's people were slaves in Egypt under the tyranny of Pharaoh. For over 400 years, they had been slaves, first to uh, work constantly under really harsh conditions. But then God had brought his people out of slavery through Moses, working for him through amazing signs and wonders. God's people were brought out of Israel. And then they were brought to Mount Sinai, where they were given the law. And it's really interesting at this point that Moses is up the mountain, receiving the incredible commandments from God. And what are the people doing at the bottom? Making a golden calf and worshipping that rather than the true God. Doesn't that just sum up humanity in a nutshell, doesn't it? You know, they're in the presence of God, and what do they want to do? Worship a cow. (laughs) It's, It's incredible, isn't it, that they did that. But what I actually find really interesting about this point is that it shows that all of the stuff in the Old Testament in the in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, shows that actually that this is a covenant of grace and not of works. And what I mean by that, it is not simply down to Israel keeping the law that they could earn their righteousness. Because if it was that, when they sinned in such a horrible way, God could have abandoned them as a nation. He should, he should have really have said, look, that's enough. Look at this. Look how sinful you are. But what he does is he gives the law a second time and Moses brings down the tablets of stone. So it is a covenant of grace. Yes, Israel were to keep this law that God had given them, but that would never be the source of their righteousness. That could never be the source of their righteousness. It is simply of sheer grace. So anyway, Israel move on from Mount Sinai and because of their unfaithfulness, they end up wandering in the desert for 40 years, doing this really weird zigzaggy type route before eventually they get to the edge of the promised land that God had promised them. And what we see in the book of Deuteronomy is basically Moses' deathbed speech. He's been told that he's not going into the promised land. And this is the second giving of the law where Moses really wants to kind of not just tell them the law, but preach the law, make it hit them on their hearts rather than it just being head knowledge. And that's what you see in the book of Deuteronomy. It's really him almost preaching this law to his people. And we see in the law that if they keep the law, there are going to be positive consequences for them. But also if they don't keep God's law, that there would be incredibly negative consequences for it. And this is where we get into the book. So we're in chapter six, and I'm going to break it down uh, into several verses at a time, and we'll see what each little section has to say. So we'll go through the whole chapter. So let's start in verse one. These are the commands, the decrees and the laws that the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess so that you, your children and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear Israel and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, 
promised you. We see there's a clear call to obedience of God's people in these first few passages. Obey and things will go well for you. There's this real clear call for obedience. But there's also this phrase, so that you may fear the Lord. And it's a phrase I've often wrestled with because it sounds a little bit odd. You know, we are to be men of courage who have fear. Does that seem almost a contradiction, perhaps? Fear is something that we experience a lot in day-to-day life. We are often fearful of things. We shouldn't be. We know that we shouldn't be. But we are often fearful of things in life. Perhaps it's fear of getting ill. Perhaps it's fear of death. Whatever it may be, we have fear in our lives. That's not what this is about, that sort of fear. The Bible tells us that we should fear God, not in a way that we would fear a villain or a tyrant, though, in a way of being scared or being petrified of God. But instead, fear is a right and proper response to who God is, a sense of awe and reverence as to who our God is. The actual Hebrew word for fear is a very physical word. The closest word I could see to it is trembling, fear and trembling. Now, if we were to go into battle and we were being shot at by the enemy, we would have that horrible sense of fear that death is imminent. That's not the type of trembling it is. We would be trembling with fear if we were being shot at. But perhaps think of a groom standing at the altar, waiting for the bride to walk down towards him. This incredibly beautiful bride. You'd have a sense of trembling, shaking at the knees of how awesome, how wonderful your bride is. And perhaps that's a little picture of the sort of trembling we should have before God. That awe, that reverence towards him. So this morning I want to ask us a question. What sort of fear do we have towards God? If you fear God in the sense that you're scared of him, I think you probably misunderstood who he is. We need to have this right fear of God in our lives. A sense of awe and reverence and love towards him. Now, fear and love are really closely linked. We see this in the next couple of passages that we're going to get to. It goes on to to talking about loving the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul and strength. So fear and love are closely interlinked. Now, I might wake up in the morning and say, I love coffee. I absolutely love a nice cup of coffee in the morning. But I might also wake up in the morning and say, I love God. I think you'd probably agree I don't mean the same thing when I say love there. They're both valid words but I mean a different thing by them. But our fear for God will define our love for God. When we have that right fear of God, it'll shape the way that we love him. When we see how awesome, how incredible, how powerful he is, not only will we have that right fear of God, but we will love him in the right way as well, not in the way that we love a cup of coffee in the morning. When we love God, we will fear him in the right way. Exodus 20 verse 20 is really interesting in this. It shows it so clearly. It says, do not fear so that the fear of the Lord may be upon you. So Israel were at Mount Sinai at this point. And you can imagine how terrifying it must have been in God's presence there. And God's saying here, don't fear so that you have the right fear of God. So don't be afraid of God so that you can have this awe and wonder as to who he is. One of the commentators I was reading wrote this. He said, this fear is not the object fear of a cowering slave, but the heartfelt devotion of a redeemed sinner. That's how we are to fear God, isn't it? And Psalm 110 says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So this morning we need to start by having that correct fear of God. And we can get incredible courage from that. So let's have that right fear as we approach God. And then in verses four and five, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength. So what we see here is that loving God is the centerpiece of the law. It's the most important commandment. Jesus himself tells us that, that it is the centre commandment. And if we remember our fear of God, remember that'll shape our love for God. When we see him as who he is, we will love him in the right way. And obedience will spring out of love. If we try and do it the other way around, where we're just trying to be obedient without really loving God, it becomes legalistic and we'll never manage. But no, we're meant to have this right love of God 
so that we are obedient to him. So how can we love God with all of our heart, soul and strength? Because it's challenging, isn't it? That's a really challenging command. Every day I look at that and think, wow, that's, that's impossible for me. But thank goodness that God works in me and makes it possible. Well, we start off by remembering who he is and what he's done for us. If we want to be men of courage, we need to be rooted in the truth of the gospel, in the good news of Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. We need to remember what he's done for us. That's how we can love him, by seeing what he's done and who he is. See what he achieved for us on the cross. When he died in our place, taking all of our sins, but giving us all of his righteousness, all of, our, all of his righteousness given to us. When we see what he's done for us, how can we not love him? What an incredible love he has for us, and therefore we love him in return. But we also need to spend time with him. If we're going to love someone, you need to spend time with them. You know, if you're in a marriage and you don't spend time with the other half of your, the other, your partner, how are you going to love them if you're not spending that time with them? So we need to spend time with God. We need to read his word. We need to spend time in prayer. We need to spend time with our God because he's revealed everything we need to know about him through his scriptures. We need to make time to read his word if we're going to love him truly. And life is busy, isn't it? I don't know about you, but life is very, very busy. And actually, we have to fight to make time to spend with God. It won't necessarily come naturally. We have to set aside time in our days. We have to make that time because life is unbelievably busy. We make, need to make a deliberate effort to spend time with God. And tr because true love demands a response, doesn't it? So do we love God's word? That leads us on to verses six to nine. Let me read them to you. Verses six to nine. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. So I've said here is the point, the courage comes from a love for God's word, when we love his word. Can we relate to God's word in the way that this verse says? It's an incredible little passage of scripture. For God's word is to be on our hearts, and what that means is it's not a chore to keep God's commands because it's on our hearts. We love God's word. This is only possible through the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, isn't it? And he changes us from within. And then it says, impress them upon your children. If you're a parent here this morning, this is a real challenge to us that we have a responsibility to teach our children and then our grandchildren the gospel. Not to just rely on them hearing it, perhaps in church, but to actually teach our children the great news of Jesus Christ. To teach our children, impress them upon your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Now, the way I read that is that means all times. All times. As Christian men, do we talk to each other enough about the great news of the gospel? It's so easy when we sit down. And I am very guilty of this, of sitting down and just talking about the football that's coming up or a film that we've watched or some other thing that we're interested in. But do we talk? Do we encourage one another enough in the great news of the gospel? I really, really enjoyed last night when we broke up into the groups and we had time to reflect, to discuss, to encourage one another as Christian men about the truths that we have learned. We need to make time to do that more. If you're not in a house group, that's a brilliant opportunity to do that. If you're not in a small group, get accountable to someone, a Christian man who you can share fellowship with. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Talk about God's truth all the time. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Now, I don't think that's literal. I don't think we have to do that to our houses when we get home today. But what it means is we're to cling to God's word. We're to view it as precious, to treasure it, to learn it. Let this be true for us, that we would cling to God's word. And that can be an incredible source of courage for us when we cling, when we love God's word. 
Let's move on to verse 10. Verse 10 through to 12. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, to give you a land with large flourishing cities that you did not build. Houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide. Wells you did not dig. Vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. Then when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And I've labelled this point, courage comes through remembering God's goodness. Get back into the context here. Israel have just been wandering the desert for 40 years. Now, I don't know if you've ever been on a camping trip. It's not the most comfortable. I would imagine the lifestyle in the camp of Israel as they wandered the desert was not the most comfortable. You know, tents are great for a couple of nights, perhaps, but I wouldn't fancy 40 years in a tent. And here they are about to go into the promised land where they would have houses, where they would have comfort. And they would have so many good things given to them. The temptation for the Israelites would be to become self-reliant, to become self-sufficient, as if they could just rely on their comfort, if they could rely on the wealth and things that they would have in their lives. And they would perhaps think, oh, this is all because we won the battle. We went to battle against these nations. We won it. We deserve these things. We did this. We did this. We've earned it. In the same way, we might go to work and we say, well, I've earned all this money. It's mine. I can do what I like with it. It's mine. It's mine. It's mine. I earned it. And actually what he's saying here is these are things that you did not grow. These are houses that you did not build. These are gifts from God. Everything that we have is a gift from God. Yes, we go to work. Yes, we earn these things. But it's a gift from God. They didn't build any of it, did they? These are cities that were already existing that they're going to conquer and they would move into. Vineyards that were already there. Do not forget the Lord in these things. He's not saying they're bad things. But he's saying we give thanks to God for the incredible things we have in our lives. It's not of our own efforts. It's purely of grace that we get these incredible things. He then reminds Israel that they would have been slaves in Egypt if it wasn't for the Lord their God. All of the good things that were going to come on these people were because of God's grace. How true is that to us? We are so quick to forget this, aren't we? That all the good things in our life come from God, not from our own efforts. And even the poorest of us in this room has been hugely blessed, I'm sure, with a roof over our head, with food on our table, with many, many good things. And it's so easy to get full of pride as Christian men and build up a sense of self-reliance, that we are the boss of our lives. But these verses are really humbling. They remind us that everything in our lives, including our salvation, that we are saved, is all because of God's grace. Verse 12 says, be careful that you do not forget the Lord. It's such a challenge, this little passage here. Do not forget the Lord when you're in your comfort, when you're in the incredible things that God gives you. Enjoy them, but remember that they are a gift from God. Let's move on to verse 13. Fear the Lord. Notice the repeat of that again. Repetition in the Bible is always trying to make a point, isn't it? Fear the Lord. Serve him only and take your oaths in his name. Do not follow other gods, the gods of the peoples around you. For the Lord your God who is among you is a jealous God and his anger will burn against you and he will destroy you from the face of the land. And I've labelled this little section, courage comes from faithfulness. This section here is a call to holiness in our lives. Israel were to make no other gods, and I've noticed here in the text, very important, lowercase gods, lowercase g. You'll see this when you look through it. You see God with a capital G and then lowercase g. So when we see the lowercase, these are the false gods. These aren't gods at all. They were to make no other lowercase gods or idols. Think back to the golden calf incident. I'm sure that's what Moses has got in mind here. This rebellious time where they made a false god for themselves and worshipped him. And in Deuteronomy chapter 20, a bit later in the book, 
we see what Israel were meant to do when they went into the promised land. They were to conquer the land and actually they were to kill everyone in it. If they were to conquer a city, they were to kill the people in the city. They were to completely destroy it. Now that might sound in 21st century Britain a crazy, a bit extreme thing to do, to go into these land and, you know, not just take prisoners if they give up, but to kill them, to fight them till the death. It does seem a bit barbaric almost. However, we see the answer in chapter 20, verse 18, why they were to do this. Otherwise, they will teach you to follow all the detestable things they do in worshipping their gods. Remember, there's a reason that God is kicking these people out of the land because of their sin, because of the detestable things that they had done. And that's why God was giving Israel this land rather than these people who were there already because of their sin. And what God is worried about is if they go in and just take slaves and prisoners, that actually they'd bed in to the culture, the sinful practices of the land, and they would become like the people who were already there. Whereas God is saying, no, you are called for holiness. You are called to be set apart, not to be like the people who are already in the land. So the worry was that they had to remove all the traces of sin so that they didn't become ensnared by it. Because there's this real danger that they would worship the false, lowercase gods of the land, of the people that were already there. And the application to us today is that we are to be in this world. We're not to go and kill the people who sin in this world. That's not what this is saying. But we are to be in this world, but not of it. To not to embrace the sinful cultures of the people around us, but to be so different from those who are unsaved. Because this world can offer us so many temptations and pleasures that God doesn't want us to have. There are so many things that can be exciting and enticing that try to ensnare us. And if we go in for them, it won't satisfy. And if Israel had not destroyed these sinful nations, then they would have embraced the culture and the practices. They would have given into it and they would worship the false gods and idols. And there is a real temptation, a real danger for us that we end up worshipping the false gods of the world around us today. Perhaps your false god is the god of money, where you seek after more and more money and the wealth that that can bring. Perhaps it's the god of sex, where that is your number one thing that you aim for in life. Where we worship perhaps celebrities and the celebrity culture of this world. Perhaps you seek after power. Perhaps you seek after that promotion in work purely because that's all you want in life, is to get up the career ladder, to get this power and status. All of these things are not necessarily bad things in their right place. But when we make them gods in our lives, they can be really dangerous. And we see here that God is a jealous God. He wants no other God but himself. And quite right, quite right for God to be a jealous God. He wants to be number one in our lives. So are there things in our lives that we worship more than God, that we love more than God? Remember, we are to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul and all of your strength. Well, what that means to me is that God is here and everything else is below. That God is number one in our lives. We are to obey his laws and commands to put him number one in our lives, not worshipping or seeking after idols. In John 14, verse 23, it says, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching." That call to obedience again, isn't it? Anyone who loves me, if we love God, we will obey his word. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. That's so encouraging that if we do love God, that God dwells within us through his Holy Spirit. We are to keep God's word and command. This is a real call to holiness, to not seek after the idols of this world. They'll be different for you than for me. You know your own idols. We need to be so, so careful that God is number one in our lives. Verse 16. Do not put the Lord your God to the test as you did at Massa. Be sure to keep the commands of the Lord your God and the stipulations and decrees that he has given you. Do what is right and good in the Lord's sight so that it may go well with you. And you may go in and take over the good land the Lord promised on oath 
to your ancestors, thrusting out all of your enemies before you, as the Lord said. And I've labelled this point that we need to trust in God's promises rather than our own strength. It can be very easy to doubt God sometimes, can't it? Very easy to doubt God. Perhaps when your prayers aren't answered, when you pray for something for a long time and it doesn't happen. Or perhaps when we see suffering going on in the world and we don't trust that God is sovereign over it. When we're going through difficulties and challenges. Well, Moses here reminds Israel of a time that they were in the wilderness and they were thirsty. That's an understandable thing in the desert, isn't it, to be thirsty? But they didn't trust that God would provide the water. They didn't trust. God had brought them out of slavery. He wasn't going to leave them to die in the desert. He would provide. And they didn't trust that God would provide the water. Instead, what they said is, is the Lord amongst us or not? No wonder God was angry. These people didn't trust that he was sovereign over the situation. But here, Moses is reminding Israel and us that God is always with us. And he is faithful to his promises. He didn't lead his people out of Egypt to die in the desert. He led them out to take them to the promised land. He is faithful to his promises. And Israel, Israel were about to fight many battles. They hadn't got the promised land yet. The promised land was still inhabited by all these nations. And they were about to go over into it and fight but it is God who would thrust out all their enemies before them. God goes before and thrusts out their enemies. They wouldn't win the promised land because of their own strength in battle. Notice that on Moses' deathbed, he's giving almost the tactics for the battle and they are not put the archers here, get your shields here and your swords here. No, it's all about obedience and love for God. It's one, in one sense, it's the strangest sense of bat, set of battle tactics, isn't it? It's not what we would do if we were giving tactics to warriors going into battle. But he gives the law again. And they would not win the battles because of their own strength. But it is God who would thrust out all their enemies before them if they are faithful to him. How true is that for us, that we don't fight in our own strength? As we've sung this morning, the battle is the Lord's. It is not our own strength that will help us to win our battles in life. But by trusting in Christ the battle is the Lord's. Do we trust God's promises? Do we trust that he is bigger than our situation? It must have seemed quite intimidating for Israel. These nations that were inhabiting the promised land would have had strong armies, fortified cities. And this is a, a country that had been living in tents. And they were to go into battle against these strong nations. But God's saying, look, if you trust me, this battle is done. It's won if we just trust in God. And then he reminds Israel and us of why we can trust God's promises. Look at verse 20. In the, in the future, when your, son, when your son asks you, what is the meaning of the stipulations, decrees and laws the Lord your God has commanded you? Tell him, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Before our eyes, the Lord sent signs and wonders, great and terrible, on Egypt and Pharaoh and his whole household. But he brought us out from there to bring us in and give us the land he promised on oath to our ancestors. The Lord commanded us to obey all these decrees and to fear the Lord our God so that we might always prosper and be kept alive, as is the case today. And if we are careful to obey all this law before the Lord our God, as he has commanded us, that will be our righteousness. You see, God wants, them, wants Israel to trust him in his future promises by reminding them of how he's saved them in the past. He's getting them to look back at how he brought them out of Egypt with a mighty hand. There was nothing of Israel's own strength that got them out of Egypt. It was all because of God. And he's saying, look, look what I've done here, getting you out of Egypt. How can you not trust? I'm going to do it in the future. I'm going to give you this promised land if you just trust me. And maybe today he's reminding us to look back at what he's already done for us. When we look back at the most important thing that he's done on the cross, that he saved us from our sins. Do we see the parallels between Egypt and our sins? Slaves in Egypt, slaves to our sin, and yet brought out entirely by God. So perhaps today he is reminding us that we have been delivered, we have been redeemed from the chains of our slavery to sin, and that we've been brought out into new life in Jesus Christ.
What an incredible gospel that we have. And he's reminding us here. And it's all because of what Jesus did on the cross. So sometimes as men of courage, we have to look back. We have to look back and see exactly what Christ has done for us. In the same way Israel constantly looked back to how they were redeemed out of Egypt, we have to look back and see, wow, look at what he's already done. How can the battles not be the Lord's? If you see with the ultimate victory that he's already won for us. And then the last little verse here, the last little verse is really interesting. It says, if we are careful to obey all this law before the Lord our God, as he has commanded us, that will be our righteousness. Does this verse imply what we call legalism, the idea that we earn our way to God? Because it's, you could say, if we do all these things, that will be our righteousness. Yes, but no. There are 613 commandments in the Mosaic law. 613. I can't remember them all, let alone keep them. I don't know how Israel managed to keep every single one of the commandments. Well, the answer is they didn't. And therefore, this cannot be a legalistic way of getting right before God, by doing your own works and deeds, by law keeping. And the reason is not a problem with the law. God's law is perfect. It's our inability to keep the law, isn't it? We are failures. We are sinful people to the core. We can't keep God's laws perfectly. But we know one who has kept the law perfectly. We know one who has lived the perfect life on our behalf, one who has died in our place, and one who gives us his perfect righteousness. So the law cannot be our righteousness. It can't be due to our inability to keep the law. And what I love is that one day the prophet Jeremiah saw ahead to a new covenant that God would make with his people. One where this law would not be on tablets of stone, but would be written on our hearts. Let me just read to you from Jeremiah chapter 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. You can see the heartbreak in this, can't you? I was a husband to them and they broke my command. We see that in the Mosaic law. But verse 33, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law on their hearts. I will put it within them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. I love, love, love that verse. He will be our God and we will be his people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbour and each his brother saying, know the Lord, for they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. There is provision for the forgiveness of sin in this new covenant. Not because of the sacrifices that would take place in the tabernacle, the goats and the bulls and the calves, but because of the sacrifice of God's only son on the cross the Lord Jesus Christ, who laid down his life so that we can have full forgiveness of sin. And what this now means is that the law of God is now within us. It's now on our hearts so that if we are saved, God's Holy Spirit dwells within us, helping us to keep his commands. So it's no longer a chore to do it, but it's a delight to keep God's commands because God's Spirit dwells within each and every one of us. So we are not obedient to God to earn our righteousness. We can't do it, can we? We are obedient to his commands because we love him, because we love the Lord our God with all of our hearts, with all of our souls and with all of our strength. And therefore it is a delight to keep his commands because we are his children. So as we bring this to a close, just go back over some of the points we've looked at. Firstly, courage comes from fear from a correct fear of who God is, from that awe and trembling as to how incredible God is. And that leads us to the correct love for God. So we can love him with all of our hearts, with all of our soul and with all of our strength. And then we have courage from loving God's word. It's on our hearts now, isn't it? It's within us. We love to read God's word. And courage co comes from remembering God's goodness, that looking back and seeing what he's done for us. Soak in the gospel every day. 
Make time to read the great news of the gospel. Remind yourself what God has done for you. Oh, there'll be nothing that will fuel your courage more than that. And courage leads to faithfulness as well. That we will be faithful to God's word. That we will want to keep his commands. And courage comes from trusting in God's promises. That the battles are his, not ours. Trusting that he is in full control. And not relying on our own strength like we are prone to do. And lastly, law keeping could never be our righteousness. We are to obey his commands, of course we are. But it can never be our righteousness. We rely on Christ's righteousness entirely. Shall we pray together? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. That you are our almighty Father. Lord, help us to have the right fear of you. Not to be scared, not to be petrified of you if there's anyone in this room this morning that has that fear of you lord i pray that you'd speak into their hearts that they'd see that they don't need to fear you in that way but just to have that sense of awe and reverence as to who you are and that we would love you with all of our hearts all of our souls and all of our strength help us to love you because of what you've done for us Help us to look back when we doubt. Help us to see what you've already done in our lives. Help us to be men that want to honour, to obey your commands. Help us to be faithful to you. But Lord, we thank you that that faithfulness, that law keeping could never earn our righteousness. It is all because of what you've done for us. The gospel is that of grace entirely of grace because of what you did on the cross when you laid down your life for us when you spilt that blood to atone for our sins oh lord we thank you and we praise you for what you did on the cross but then we thank you that you rose from the grave and because we are united to you in that resurrection that you have now conquered sin and death we no longer have to fear death because of what you achieved and that we can look forward to that day where we will go into the ultimate promised land. Into the new Jerusalem to spend all eternity with you. Well, we thank you and we praise you for what you've done, for who you are. And Lord, I pray that you would change each and every one of us. So that we become more like your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. In your mighty name. Amen. Amen.